Hello, I'm Sam Buchanan, CEO of the IMAA, and you're listening to the IMAA Academy Series Regional 101, proudly coming from ACAR Studios. Regional 101 is one of the eight-part series in the IMAA Academy. In this podcast, you'll hear from four media experts who are going to share their knowledge and working experience around regional. Brian Gallagher, Chief Sales Officer of SEA and also Chair of Boomtown. Justin Duggan, Group Media Director of Stratosphere. Leslie Sweeney, Managing Director of Sweeney Advertising. And Steve Fagan, Director of Media Republic. Ahead, we're going to discuss planning, tips and strategies for regional media. So listen up and enjoy the episode. Firstly, guys, welcome our panellists. I'm going to throw around the room and love you to tell us about where you are, where you've come from and your journey in your career. Leslie, tell us about you. My name is Leslie Sweeney. I'm Managing Director of Sweeney Advertising, which I own with my husband, Craig Sweeney. Started my career in radio in Sydney. Was lucky enough to work at 2UW, Triple M, 2CH and 2GB. We had a number of clients wanting us to replicate the campaigns nationally. And because at that point in time, there wasn't a national footprint for 2GB, we set up our own business, Sweeney Advertising. One of our biggest clients at that point in time did an awful lot of regional radio. So I absolutely love regional media and have a real passion for it. Fantastic. Brian, tell us about your journey. So I started out at NBN Television in Newcastle as a rep and ended up joining Channel 9 and had a few years doing Metro TV and then went off and worked in the UK in pay TV. I came back to set up a business that was called Nine Affiliate Sales, so back into the regional TV space and I did that for quite a while. And and then uh, when, when Blackie, who I'd worked with at Channel 10, ended up being appointed as CEO of SCA, I ended up coming in with him to be Chief Sales Officer, and that's what I'm doing now. Justin, tell us about you. Justin Duggan. Uh, I head up the media department at Stratosphere in Melbourne. So I've been working media agencies for about 25 years, mainly multinationals. But then five years ago, I came aboard at Strat to really start up the media team. Been here for five years. We have mainly retail clients, Chemist Warehouse and The Good Guys being the main two. Very passionate regional buyer because I live in regional Victoria, so I know the market very well. So that's me. Fantastic. Steve Fagan, tell us about you. Thanks, Sammy. I'm Steve Fagan, founder of Media Republic. I've been in the industry almost 35 years, starting out in a full service agency, being DDB Needham. Spent five years there and then 12 months in sales at News Limited and then worked for Harold Mitchell for almost 20 years before setting up Media Republic in 2012. So had lots of experience with many, many clients over the years buying regional media. Looking forward to our discussion today. Fantastic. So look, kicking off our discussion on regional, Brian, tell us about what does regional consist of? Tell us about the market and where does it start and stop and how would you describe it to the listeners? Everything that isn't Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide or Perth. So, you know, and I was listening to you say before, you know, some people say it's nine mil, some people say it's 9.3. Ah, splitting hairs. It's nine or more. (laughs) (laughs) Depend on how you count the bleed over on Metro TV or advertising. So you've got to buy it all. But yes, everything that's not Cap City is, is pretty much us. Made up of nine plus million people. Yeah, just over nine million. Yeah. Fantastic. 36% of Australia's population is in regional. 100%. And growing. Okay, so we're going to go around the room and might start with Dugo and talk about, from your perspective, when should regional be used and what type of clients would benefit from it? Yeah. Thanks, Samuel. We, as I mentioned in my opening, we have a lot of retail clients so and a lot of big retail clients. So when should regional be included is when they've got store locations, when they've got a footprint. And you know, we're lucky in that our two biggest clients have a lot, a big footprint in regional. So virtually every campaign we do, the regional is included in it. So yeah, it really depends for us where the location of the stores are being retail. So that's how we do, how we start with the regional. Yeah, amazing. Brian? Yeah, I pick up on that. That's a really, that's a, that's a really critical insight as to why we actually started the Boomtown program. 
that kind of insight that, you know, if there's a store there, if there's a location there, if there's a cash register there, you need to be advertising there. And the, 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 one, of the, one of the core insights that we shared amongst all the other regional media proprietors when we sat down to think about trade marketing for regional media per se was that there were certain clients we had not a single problem with in terms of, you know, revenue support for the markets. And they were all the retailers that had access to their own cash register tape. So, you know, you got your Coles, your Woolworths, your McDonald's and your Super Cheaps and, you know, your Chemist Warehouses that are, that are fully invested. And they spend a commensurate amount of money reaching the same kind of audiences percentage-wise in each territory as they would in a metro market. Then you've got a whole other cohort of advertisers who don't have access to that granular level data and they're heavily underinvested. And so we would go in and actually look at the market shares that they were getting through metro versus regional markets. You could see the difference. So I think that Dago's insight's key there. It's fair to say there, Brian, that that other category would be FMCG products where, you know, often they, they're not getting that, that sales data through, which then, you know, studies have been done over the years based on that level of investment versus ROI. So that's been key. And it was many, many years ago where tests and case studies were done where the level of investment in the regional markets on a CPM basis were significantly more efficient than the the metro markets. So. Yeah, and the upside there is there because, you know, across FMCG in particular, the percentage of national advertising dollars that they were punching into regional media some years ago was 4%. And yep. you've mentioned before that the 36% of the population. So something's got to give. So when you ran the data out of, say, for instance, Nielsen's old panorama back in the day, the studies that you're talking about, Steve, is when we started trotting panorama out to the market and it started breaking out the market shares from Sydney versus, say, regional New South Wales or Victoria splitting that up regional versus Melbourne. And Meadow Lee Margarine is sitting there on a fantastic market share in Sydney of, you know, 17% of the margarine market. It's got 8%, you know, in, in regional markets and home brands taking the rest. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because, as you say, with 36% of the population in regional, only 10% of the national media spend is going into regional. And that uh, doesn't make any sense because, of course, these are the now. same. We've fixed a bit of it. Have you? Yeah, a little bit. Congratulations. <laughs> Good. Boomtown, I think, is yeah. fantastic huge, because huge it's not effort. only making it more top of mind, but it's making it more accessible and easier to buy. And I think those are two really key things in terms of building that regional spend. But from where we're sitting, we have clients like Caruso's Natural Health, where it really doesn't matter whether, because they are truly national in terms of their distribution, it doesn't matter whether the vitamins sell in Pitt Street Mall or they sell in Wagga Wagga, right? It, the, the money's the money and the consumer's the consumer. And from the company perspective, it's about having a national strategy that then rolls out consistently across metro and regional. And then on the other hand, we have clients like the CCIA New South Wales, which is Caravan Camping Industry Association, and they do show all the expos. So, for example, the big one, obviously, in Sydney, Caravan Camping Holiday Super Show, but then the Newcastle Caravan Camping Holiday Expo, which is happening actually around February every year. And it's really great because then you're really into a market where you're treating it almost like local area marketing and then pulling all those pieces of the puzzle together with all four radio stations, TV, outdoor, all of those key things that you can then really dominate the market over a short period of time press and really have a massive splash in that environment. Brian, your role is Chief Sales Officer of SEA, but you also have the other hat of Boomtown Chair. Tell us about Boomtown and what you guys do. Yeah, so a few years ago, it's going to be almost five years ago now, that we got together with the CEOs of all the regional, or as many of the, the, the mainstream regional media companies as we could to sort of put forward an idea that we should come together to do trade marketing for regional markets. Now, SCA was obviously very heavily invested. We had, you know, about 90 radio stations across the markets and we had the regional TV affiliation. So we were quite motivated to turn national advertisers' attention to the power of regional markets to grow market share for, for brands. We were very across the splits of spend, how they worked and which advertising categories were underinvested. And we had done on our own a lot of work trying to convert advertisers to spending more weight in regional. And every time we did a good job of pushing forward the argument, we would do a good deal. And we just figured a rising tide would float more boats 
and so decided to come together with the whole industry and try to, I guess, put a trademark on the regional media space and, and, and get media buyers thinking about it and including it and to also get brands aware that there is market share growth there for you if you want to chase it. And certainly advertisers out there that are very fully invested in, in regional, and I think we, 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 we can talk about fast food and retail as being very, very aware of the market share and the sales that they're getting in those local markets. But to Steve's earlier point, you know, FMCG is an example, heavily underinvested. Even finance and banking, less invested than they should. And there's a lot of perception around some of that underinvestment and a lot of habit around some of that underinvestment. And so if you really want to just take a big paintbrush and paint it across the consortium media buying space, five cap city TV media buy is the paramount number one thing you've got to do and get right. Now, you know, if there's any money left, then we might do some radio and then we might do some outdoor and then we might do this, that and the other. Now, those kind of tactics were in play many, many, many years ago. And if there was any money left, maybe Newcastle would get a bite of the cherry. And quite often there wasn't. So, you know, getting the five cap city TV by squared away in a rising market where the avails are short and all the rest of it is creating a whole bunch of issues, soaking up cash. And, and a lot of, particularly in that case, regional TV didn't really get as much of a look in as it probably should have. So then you got radio similar. And radio on a whole other level with all those like a million call signs very, very tough for the rank and file media buyer to get their head completely around how to actually get that job done really well. A lot of that radio space even unsurveyed. And, you know, when you're moving to these levels of high levels of accountability and clients really want to know they're going to get good bang for their buck, that's just, you know, not acceptable. So a whole bunch of things had to change. And so Boomtown is just one part, one lever, which is the trade marketing positioning and landing the message that there's growth there if you want it. And so ourselves, News, Win, Prime, which is now 7 and 9, ARN, HT&E, now, who am I missing? O-Media and ACM. <laughs> uh, so they've all come together and stayed together for the last sort of five years, sort of funding that program. And a lot of the, the what, one of the great things we've been able to do is kind of dispel some of the myths that those regional populations have actually got money to spend. They do have disposable income. They are interested in brands. They do spend more on travel than some of their metro counties. Parts. And, you know, I, I think three of the top five e-commerce locations in Australia are actually regional locations. So there's, you know, it, whether you're Amazon or, or Kmart, it doesn't matter. The opportunities are there. And I think one of the interesting things is how COVID really shifted the population of the regional areas as well, because this sea change, tree change, which used to be something that was sort of a retirement ambition, is happening a lot younger now with families moving out there due to wanting a change of lifestyle, also wanting increased affordability of housing, which then obviously leads to increased disposable income, which then can be spent on all of the things you're talking about. But this perception, I think, that's out there is that regional means rural, and it doesn't, right? A lot of these areas are yeah, more vibrant, in fact, more populous than for example, mm. your Hobarts, your Darwins, your Canberras, which are yeah. considered to be, you know, cap cities. And what's quite interesting is about 37% of people in regional areas are, in fact, in professional or managerial jobs, whereas only 2.5% are in agriculture or, or forestry, which, again, is where we think regional and we think farmers. And that's not it at all. And the people who Fantastic. are living in these areas are exactly like the people who are living in the metro areas. They want the same things. They want, they have the same a lot of the same attitudes and towards of supporting Australian manufacturing and Australian products and toward being more environmentally friendly. Certainly, travel is, is very key. Finance is very key. Investment. So all of these things that matter to people in metro markets are identical to those that matter in regional. Only there you're looking at an environment where because there is so much less investment of advertising, there's also less clutter. So the opportunity to buy market share, exactly as you put your finger on before, is much greater than it is in an environment like for example, Sydney, where it is so competitive and we are so overwhelmed with advertising in every form, all day, every day. So in regional, the opportunities, I think, are very, very significant for companies to move in and, and buy that additional growth. Steve, whilst we're talking about myth-busting and, and the audience, is there anything you want to add to that? 
I think the biggest misperception is the regional and rural, you know, and we covered that off in terms of the percentage, you know, that there's only a smaller percentage that are actually, you know, workers on the land, farmers and, you know, ag- agriculturalists. So as way back as 25, 30 years ago, we call them the savvy marketers and, and buyers were actually doing test campaigns in in Newcastle to to test the worthiness of launching a, a product in a metro market and, and nationally. So the smarter marketers out there have always sort of utilised regional markets. They are just normal everyday consumers. And the sooner, you know, the younger buyers, uh, the newer buyers in market understand that, then the better opportunities you know they can present to their clients and greater benefit it is to the the regional you know, media conglomerates so that's probably the biggest misperception out there is is the audience composition you also got to look at the size of some of the markets like northern new south wales i think now has the third most populous market in australia would that be right brian yeah that's just that's about great. right yeah yeah so it's bigger than brisbane and it's probably double the size of adelaide and perth so you know, if you don't advertise in this market, you're missing a massive percentage of the Australian population. Yeah. We often present media strategies and plans, you know, that would exclude an Adelaide and include a, a northern New South Wales, yeah. you know, in terms of reaching a greater audience. In fact, we've done that for, you know, a, a new tech startup last year that we we probably spent 40% of the available TV budget in regional markets and excluded Sydney. Might well have got delivery of 100% of the spots too. I reckon. <laughs> absolutely. The bonus See? levels you get in regional are spectacular. Definitely an yeah, Absolutely. We pride ourselves on it. <laughs> <laughs> and a one-for-one deal. Just, I'm keen to understand when considering planning and executing a regional campaign, what do you think about it? How do you use it? It's probably not too similar to Metro. We... Again, we, we always put regional in the plan, Sam. So, you know, we don't treat it all that different. We just treat it as part of Australia. So when we execute, when we're planning, it's what's the reach we need per market. And it's the same reach percentage wise that we need in Sydney, that we need in Northern, that we need in regional Queensland, that we need in Darwin. So it's this now obviously different numbers, but it's the same percentage. We want to hit reach. So that's all it's about reaching a percentage of people for TV in each market. So it's not it's no different to Metro. So we don't it's not the Holy Grail Metro. It's it's the same thing as between Metro and Regional. Fags, what about you? What do you consider? Yeah, Doug is fortunate enough to work on some clients with with mega budgets. And um, <laughs> <laughs> when you're working with clients with a finite budget and audience reach is a critical component, but it's also the ROI on that investment. So if the budget can't afford Sydney, but we want to be able to deliver some numbers, you know, a, akin to that or a, Br- a Brisbane, then then we certainly look at a northern and southern New South Wales combo buy, and you can be delivering some audience numbers not too dissimilar. So we look at it from that perspective. Certainly, the product and the service has got to be available in those markets. But I guess with the experience that we've you know, that, that's around this table today is that we understand and appreciate the value of those, uh, you know, that 36% of the Australian population. They're all, you know, got disposable incomes and can spend. So it's not an afterthought. It's a very upfront consideration. It's interesting, Fags. I'll jump in. And obviously, you, know, you mentioned we do have some big budgets for some of our big clients, but there was a client that we picked up last year that was an, it's an alcohol client. It's a spirit client and uh, they don't have those big budgets. So we did a, a lot of store mapping with the client and where they think they're going to get the sales. And, you know, it's probably 50 50 metro regional. But when we looked at where we can really get more bang for our buck in terms of advertising, we did a 100% regional TV buy in winter last year and absolute, for a launch, absolutely smashed it out of the park. So, you know, we didn't touch Metro at all. Metro, and we did a little bit of regional out of home as well in, in key markets, you know, the big bourbon belt and smashed it, absolutely killed it. And we had a meeting with them the other week and doubled their budgets for regional this year. Still not touching Metro because you get more bang for your money in regional and it was the perfect audience for it. So it worked really well. Yes, ROI, it's better out, yep. Brian, 
When considering planning and buying a regional campaign, what should an agency look out for? Every single brand, every single client has a specific strategy and, you know, I, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult to sort of paint a common brush over everyone's approach to how they're buying media. But I'd probably say, you know, most planners start with, you know, audiences, objectives and, and, and start to work through there. I mean, one of the things I think we've just got to make sure, particularly with the Boomtown program, is that we're getting the message to that younger cohort of planners and buyers that, that, you know, they just clearly understand that there is an opportunity in those audiences to move the needle for their client. And that's all we can ask. I mean, whether it's an outdoor strategy or a, a direct response strategy or a high reach, high engagement TV commercial strategy, I mean, that's all those things that work in those metro campaigns, work in those regional campaigns as well. And uh, you can segment markets geographically for the purposes of doing exactly what the guys were just explaining, you know, apportioning cash to markets where you think your ROI is going to be better. And that's exactly, and, you know, step by step, you know, if you've got a small or medium sized account, you're trying to get something major in terms of return on investment, you figure out that, you know, initially you can only afford to buy, you know, East Coast, you do a good job of that. And the client's going to stump up next time with enough money to maybe take your national. So look, all we're looking for is just consideration, an opportunity to pitch, put the regional media companies on the brief if they're not already and see what they've got to offer because there's value out there at the moment especially. I think one of the other things to take into consideration is that regional Australians really love where they live and are really bonded to their community. And that sense of community spirit really translates in terms of their relationship with the local media and the local media personalities. And of course, the media then is integrally involved in the community as well in terms of events and sponsorships being very on the ground and very visible. So these relationships are much more personal and intimate than they are in, in the larger markets where people don't have that sort of direct contact. And I think advertisers can really leverage those relationships to build trust and to generate sales. Yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting point because the, the local advertisers are getting all of the headspace around things like live reads, particularly in, in that regional radio space. Mm -hmm. Now, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years from the Southern Cross Stereo perspective trying to package and simplify the integration pieces that, you know, so we spend a lot of our time, you know, figuring out what a client's going to do in a Sydney breakfast show or in, you know, in, in, in Fox breakfast or on Triple M drive or whatever it is that we're going to do around integration and all the rest of it. Now, all that work, we can actually do that same level of integration right out through our regional feeds. That's kind of an area where we do need to sort of, I guess, let buyers know that that stuff is very doable to capitalise on that great insight. Yeah, those audiences feel the same way about their local breakfast and drive shows as our Metro counterparts do. So, And yeah. even more so, I would argue. And you can get to them. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's interesting because how you know that these relationships are so strong is, for example, the fact that live reads are one of the main things and, and cannot quite often be sold out. Certainly breakfast sponsorships yeah. or news, traffic, weather, well, not so much traffic necessarily, depending on where you are, but news, weather. Those things are taken by the local advertisers 12 months a year. They're oh, very hard the, to access because they are so effective. At least the traffic people. reports in, in regional areas are always good news. <laughs> <laughs> no traffic today. <laughs> our, I yeah. wish we were getting good news here. <laughs> The one other thing is that you talk about the local advertisers and if you go back to TV, I think anyone who's spent time in, in regional parts of Australia has certainly had to have been exposed to a Tank World ad um, yes. over the course of the, the years. So the, the ability to cut through with, you know, stronger quality commercials, you know, if you're a national advertiser, the you know, the, the cut through is certainly there. I might start, Leslie, with you on this one. When starting off a, a planning a campaign in regional, where do you start? Because there's a few more selections that you've got to go through. Where do you start off? I mean, the considerations are the same as Metro in the sense that you're always client-focused in terms of what are their campaign objectives, what is their market, what is their budget, how is it going to be best executed as a campaign. And, again, a lot of the time our regional buyers are part of a national buy. It, it's simply the same logic and thought process that goes into delivering that in regional as in metro. Having said that, there are things that are, that are different. So, for example, some of the options 
are different. So there's not a lot of transit, for example. Billboards, as I said, are usually sold out long term. So trying to get a, any kind of outdoor campaign in regional markets can be very challenging. There's limited inventory, and it's incredibly popular. One of the things I think is also to have an understanding of the local area. If it is specifically something where, uh, as I said, we do a lot of property developments. So you might end up in some town that you've never been to before. It's important to understand because that, in fact, is a local area marketing campaign rather than a part of a national strategy. What the people listen to there, what are the most popular billboards, find out from the people on the ground what people listen to, where do they go, and just get a sense of what the community is actually doing so that you're coming at it with a bit of inside knowledge. And the interesting thing is, and you're not necessarily going to like hearing this, but certainly over the years we have bought, rather than through your SCAs and your ARNs, bought direct. And I'll tell you now, when you get some rep who's you know, in-house in Townsville, right, and you're calling up and you've got a big client, they are jumping through hoops for you. Your rates are exceptional. You're Kind of like having an independent agency on your business. Kind of like that, exactly. Someone who really cares, is deeply passionate about it and highly committed to your success. And doing that because, again, it's not one person sitting in an office in Sydney and you're one small piece of business. That, that, that one campaign in Townsville is not a big deal to them, but it's certainly a big deal to, to the rep in-house. But I think more than that, it's also about the relationships that these people bring to the party. So the ability for them to speak to the traffic manager to make sure they're getting the best placement for the ads, speak directly to the announcers who are doing the live reads to make sure they're 100% on board, speak to promotions to see what value add you can get. And those in-house relationships are invaluable. And the ability to then deliver on a whole other level for your clients can can really be shown through maximizing those relationships for your clients. Right? But of course, you have to have those relationships yourself. Yeah, and it can get a little unwieldy, but I think I've come full circle on that one because I think if, if people are prepared to go and make the effort to, to get in touch with those stations and do the hard yards, then have at it. Absolutely. I mean, it's not, not a problem from my perspective. But interestingly There's enough, with, with television, it's sort of the other way around, right? You really are, because you can buy, as you say, Northern New South Wales, Southern New South Wales, Victoria, as one buy. That, from, if you are buying nationally, it can, is infinitely more cost efficient and delivers much greater reach than, for example, going and buying 50 radio stations. One of the things I always thought was pretty confusing for the, for the buy side, um, and again, you alluded to it, with, you know, just in, re in reference to radio call signs and there's not a straight up set of fixed media assets in every regional centre. There's sort of subtle differences everywhere you go. So that's one of the reasons why we, under the Boomtown banner, built the hub because it's an opportunity. You can, you know, if you're a retailer, you can tap in all your postcodes and it'll give you a pretty good map of which media outlets are in which markets and who you need to brief and how you can brief them. I think that's been pretty helpful. Fantastic resource, Brian. It's, I was going oh, to jump you. in and say the same thing. It's one of the first things we go to when we get a, a new brief for something and we're looking at different markets and look what's available in that market. The Boomtown website's amazing. Oh, so that's I think great we've done really hear. well. Thank yeah. you. Now, we put that CMV data in there as well, sort of category-based, so you can look at individual sort of categories and see how they perform as retail level or whatever in regional markets. And I think that's pretty useful too because it gives you an opportunity to go to your clients and say, look, here's a whole bunch of category expenditure information and it's showing you that the consumers in these markets are into this category. They're buying it. So it, it de-risks market selection, I think. Amazing. Where do you start, Dugo, when you're looking at a campaign and, and you want to work out where to put the spots and dots? When we do the strategy for any campaign in region, we think about the audience and what they're doing and where they're going to be. And obviously, you do a lot of research. And so if they're going to be in TV, what TV networks? And of course, it's always going to be SCA. We, we want to get the eyeballs, all the ears. And so it's not, it's not hard. You just need to find where the audience is. That, that's how we start planning and that's how we negotiate it. So you, you mentioned earlier on store mapping. Yes. Can you explain a little bit further about what that is? Yeah, that's fine, uh, Sam. So using a chemist warehouse as an example, we've got over 100 stores in regional Australia. So we get a store map when we plan out the national campaigns. We look at all where all the stores are and we actually use the Boomtown website to help out. So we look at, okay, and at the moment, there's like 13 or 14 stores in Darwin. So, okay, we've got 14 stores in Darwin. We might have 10 stores in, in Hobart. And we map out where we need to advertise. 
both in TV, in TV and radio particularly. Now, TV is a lot easier because of the aggregate nature of the TV, but radio is a lot harder to map out because you've got all those, we've mentioned this a few times, you've got all those little regional radio stations. So we buy probably 45 different regional markets in, in radio So, because every store has to get supported in the same way as the stores in Sydney, the stores in Darwin, to the store in Gympie has to get the same level of support in terms of reach. So it's very important to map out the locations of stores and match them up with the TV network, radio network. In the past, print. Now, a lot of prints disappeared in regional, but it is an important part of a media planner's job to know where their stores are. To your point about print, that's actually something that was completely smashed by COVID. So you're looking Mm. at over 60 regional newspapers having shut down entirely and over 40 having gone simply to digital editions. So that, which used to be an incredibly strong medium in those areas, has changed dramatically over the last few years. Radio, I think, is, as you say, crucial in these areas and people are so, so loyal to their local radio stations, but also it's easy because, as you know, half the places that you'd even go, you now have Triple M and Hit. And, I mean, with knowing absolutely nothing about anything, you still know Hit skews younger, Triple M skews older. And, and it's interesting because that was one of the things when, I'm talk, when I was saying about buying local, you'd have these talk radio stations that were, you know, sort of a regional equivalent of 2GB. Mm. And then now it's called Triple M. Yeah. Right. And it's the format is nothing like what one could consider triple M format. Yeah. However, it's part of that national network. And interestingly enough, the other thing that's come along with that is syndication. So that you are now having these areas that are taking programming out of Sydney, Melbourne, etc. Mm-hmm. In these national, particularly, drive yeah. shows. Yeah. And it's interesting because I guess to some degree that definitely benefits the broadcaster. But from a local perspective, it's taking away that intimacy and that live and local element that is really the power of radio. Yeah, we've had to be very careful with that because we actually had a similar cohort of several dozen different radio call signs that used to be our regional network. And we made that fairly pivotal decision, I think it must have been six years ago now, to sort of, because they they were programmed already very much in the hit triple m way but they had their local original local call signs like you know central coast 2go and so we ended up well we did think long and hard about that shift and we copped a hell of a lot of flack about that and at the same time we're also rolling out a, a, a kind of a mandate for measuring everywhere with with audience measurement so highly risky for us to sort of change the the call signs and and demand audience measurement all at the same time. Fortunately for us, it really landed. I think the big difference in regional is that Triple M really did land and it actually is usually in most markets the more dominant kind of reaching station, which is quite cool. And there's a whole lot of effort going in around the programming of music and the sound of the station in each individual markets. And so I think there's 44 regional Triple M stations and they all sound subtly different. You know, it's, it, it's interesting. So we've tried to maintain sort of local elements but still develop off the back of a national media brand. So it's quite a tricky thing Absolutely. <laughs> to do. Especially when, as I said, people are so attached internally to yeah, those stations 100%. in their own markets. We had a, a meeting with a client today who still couldn't get their head around the Triple M Bendigo, the call sign, <laughs> and... and you know, but it, 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 it'll be just like Triple M Melbourne. It's like, no, there are, there are local nuances. Yeah. And, and that's probably one of the challenges as an agency and buyers that we face is the ability to educate clients at the same time. And, and again, the younger, younger buyers of today don't have that experience. They're not necessarily ingrained TV or, or radio listeners themselves. Mm-hmm. So that in and of itself is is a real challenge. So Boomtown's been great and that's one of the the tabs that we've got on all of our juniors computers as a go-to and when briefs are presented, they're the ones that are actually ferreting away and learning, you know, about the different call signs and the, the different media channels there. So and then the next step is to actually understand, you know, what – programming, you know, nuances are in each of those markets. Steve, is there any tips that you can give your or our listeners today about trying to educate clients about, you know, regional media? 
I think it's immerse yourself in it as much as you can, be able to, I guess, learn and, and understand that 98% of the programming, you know, on TV in regional markets is exactly the same as the metro markets. The radio stations, the call signs are, are very similar and that the important thing is the consumers are no different, uh, you know, to those that are walking around in metropolis markets. So, you know, they've got, you know, hands in their pockets and wallets to open and mobiles to click Apple Pay on. So, you know, they, they all want to spend. Brian, over to you. I want to ask you, what do you see in the next five years, 10 years about regional? You know, is it growing? Is there, are we all going to move out to our country dream, commute to the city three days a week? What's the future hold? Well, look, I think the Regional Australia Institute's actually done quite a fair bit of work on this, and there's going to be, I think, continued migration of population into regional markets for a lot of the reasons we've already talked about, which is that there's a a quality of life there. I think workplace change is the single biggest shift in that because, you know, we don't absolutely have to be tied to North Sydney or... Essendon to do our jobs anymore. You know, we can do what we do from just about any location. And one of the great parts about my job is that I actually can be physically located just about anywhere in Australia and still be in my workplace. And that's very cool and unique. But I think the work flexibility piece along with the lifestyle piece, you know, and just the the sheer hell of the early morning commute is it's a real disincentive for hanging around. And there's a nicer way to live. So I think I was expecting to see that 70, 80,000 people that had moved out of Sydney and Melbourne to move to regional kind of reverse itself across sort of this year and next. And the projections are that that's not going to happen. So over the course of the next five years, I, I kind of see probably those outer outer metro fringe areas and those kind of close by located sort of regional markets like Newcastle, Geelong, Wollongong, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, Central Coast. These are going to be explosive areas, I think. I think what's going to happen then is that people that currently are living there are going to, you know, there are going to be people that go from there out to the next. And so I see a bit of a bridge down the coast. I mean, we've still got some pretty unique geography that kind of means there's still going to be remote populations living right across, you know, the western belt of kind of New South Wales, northern Victoria, out into the western Queensland spaces and all the rest of it. They're not exactly hospitable places to be on the daily. But the urbanised markets that we have, which make up, you know, 85% of our population uh, in regional, are just going to continue to expand and, and to de- and moreover develop. I mean, the amount of places that I know from my childhood up around Maitland and up in the Upper Hunter, you know, where kids are now going to sort of, you know, grammar schools and private schools that didn't even exist in those markets when I was there, there's this infrastructure sort of coming into play now that was never there before. So if you want to have a kind of a heavily urbanised lifestyle with great lifestyle and way of life, but you still want tricky private schools and, you know, overseas holidays and all that sort of crap, I mean, you're getting that at half the price and it, it's and not going to go away. And you can away. work from home now and you can, you, you can have it all. And not to mention the housing prices in Australia are still unattainable to most. So. Well, that's exactly right. And, you I know, think we've got a perfect case in point there, haven't we, Dago? Yeah, 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 exactly. Look, I moved I moved from Melbourne. I live in July, on the other side of Geelong. I moved six, seven years ago now and, yeah, I'll never come back to Melbourne and the family are growing up in Geelong. My daughter, the oldest daughter goes to a private school. Yes, I trying to get away on an annual overseas holiday, Brian. I'm trying to. <laughs> um, but, you know, the flexibility of being able to work from home, I'm in the office today, but the flexibility, like I come in probably three days a week, but I get the train. So I sit in the train for an hour doing all my emails. It's great. Now, the biggest issue with the growth is going to be the infrastructure around transport and the like. So there's a bit of work to be done while well, knowing Victoria. So that'll be interesting to see moving forward because Geelong is, you know, it's probably almost doubled in size in the last seven years since I've moved down there. And every time you go for a drive, there's a new housing development going up, which is amazing. But the infrastructure around that is not growing at the same pace. So it'd be interesting to see how it goes. Guys, we've got a tremendous amount of experience in the room. So I'm going to go around the room and ask best career tips and advice. Dago, you, what would you say to the next generation or someone thinking about starting in the media industry? Someone who came to me and said, I want to be in the media industry, I'd say do it. It's the great industry. It's an ever-evolving industry. You're doing something 
that people take an interest in. People always are watching TV. They're listening to music. They're listening to the radio. So you always got something to talk about. And when you're getting to the media industry, ask questions. I always say to all new starters, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Ask questions. Go to every supplier meeting. You need to know as much as you can in your first couple of years. Be a sponge. Absorb everything. Go in the office as much as possible? As much as you can, yeah. Look, within reason. Look, we're in four days a week and we've had no issue with that for the last couple of months. Be in the office because you are going to learn from the office. You aren't going to learn as much sitting at home by yourself in front of a computer. We always use the water cooler moments because you do talk about stuff at work and you do learn like that way as well. Everything I learned in media, the very little things I learned, is from sitting next to someone significantly smarter than me and just sponging and asking questions off them. I think it's the same with, with most. I sat next to Fags for a little while, so I did a lot of them. Sorry about that. Yep, you, you learn all your best stuff from me. <laughs> it's the blind leading the blind. Yeah, um, exactly. Steve Fager, what about you for, for, for a tip or advice? I listen to everything that, that Justin's mentioned, but more so immerse yourself in, in the media. So what do I mean by that? A lot of the youngsters coming into market today watch video or, or TV you know, on their laptops. They've got to understand that that's part of the way, but connected TVs in the lounge room are still critical to reaching mass audiences. There is such a thing as, as a radio station, not just Spotify or Sound, you know, Cloud. The big billboards out there are there to reinforce what's going on on those screens and the radio. And whilst print, there is still for newspapers along the way. So understand as much as you can about absolutely everything. You know, I think that's for new people. And, and you know, we've seen over the course of the years people who have entered the media world on the digital side be equally fascinated to see a Google ad on the side of a tram rather than just on the screen that they're conducting their Mm. keyword searches for for clients. So just live and breathe it. Enjoy the social aspects. There's a lot of fun to be had. The, The media industry, like many others, can take you around the world. So, you know, it's transportable, reaching frequencies, uh, a language, you know, here in Australia as it is in the US or the UK or or Europe. So, yeah, just dive headfirst into it. Have fun. Sound advice. Brian? Yeah, well, you know, content is culture and the content that's happening around us through the media and the privilege of being a publisher is kind of, it's kind of like the heartbeat if you like, of the of the community we're in. So it's a real privilege to be a part of it in, in that sense. And I think an appreciation for that and the, and the power of content, I think, is, a, is, is something that people that work on my side would do well to really appreciate. You know, from a business perspective, uh, you know, I, I think there's just a couple of things. One piece of advice I got given when I was very young, because I was quite a blatherer, was you've got, you know, two ears and one mouth for a reason, use them in direct proportion. And uh, I, I do try to occasionally remember that because it's pretty important. <laughs> and, I, and I think one thing that I, I rabbit on about to my people all the time till their ears bleed is the importance of staying connected to the news cycle. If we're in the media sales space and we're not right across the fin review, what's going on, you know, in business, if we're not whether it's we're getting it through Google News or Apple News or whatever, but staying in touch with absolutely everything that's happening in the business community and how that impacts advertisers so that when we're in front of advertisers and they're telling us things, we've got context for the challenges that they face and that we're able to actually then align our assets to be of use to them when it's important. Because quite often the media sales guys are all about trying to sort of fill the quota and it's not the best way to go. You know, sort your clients out first and the quota will look after itself. Wise words. Leslie. I think understanding the value of relationships and understanding that it is an incredibly small media village that we live in. People will change from radio to TV to agency, but you are going to come across all of these people again and again. And that's really important to make sure you don't burn any bridges, that you are professional and that that you understand that it's the relationships that are going to set you apart um, over your, over other people in the in the industry. And also that because it is such a small industry, your, your reputation and, and your credibility is key. 
And once you've lost that, you can't get it back. So very important that you're always doing the right thing by people because if you're not, you will get caught out and it's not a good place for, for people to be. So as I said, very, very small industry, full of amazing people, but we all know the ones that aren't. <laughs> Don't talk about Steve Fagan that way. I, I, I was going to say one of my mentors and, and long-time bosses drummed into us, it's, it's so important that we understand our clients' businesses as well as if not better than them. So because if we don't do that, then we're, we're not living and breathing and uh, their business and we, we can't provide the solutions in accordance. So, and that goes to, you know, to, I guess reiterates what Brian was saying as well, stay in touch with the new cycle. So we've got to know our clients' business as, as better than them. The, the last agency I worked at, we would have a day where we just spent it in the client's shop and just, you know, talking to customers, talking to staff, going out back, you know, understanding every step of it. So that's really important, Fags. I think along with understanding their business, it's 100% having their back and putting them first. So, for example, Frank Caruso, in my very early days of working with him, he said, you need to have your Frank hat on, right? So he, for example, did all the, um, the magazine buying, which was huge for, for him at that point in time. And those poor reps, he would chew them up and spit them out. And that was my job with every other media was to do the same, right? To be, be frank in every situation. And exactly as you said, once the client is the priority and you're fighting for them, everything else will fall into place, right? If you're worried about budgets, if you're worried about commissions, if you're worried about any of that, that's where you get lost because your focus is in the wrong place. You do the right thing by the clients and you have their back 100% and you have their hat on, then all of those other things will fall into place and you will be successful. Brian, what are some of the barriers to buying regional? Uh, look, I think the biggest one is market knowledge about what's going on out there. And so for that's one of the reasons that we put the Boomtown Hub up, but it's also one of the reasons that we conduct the Boomtown Masterclasses. And that's been an opportunity to sort of educate that sort of entry-level and mid, mid-level mid media buying executive and sort of get them right across all the fundamentals of who's out there, uh, how they're positioned, what you can do, and all the rest of it. And I think that's been that's been very, very helpful. Fantastic. And for all IMAA members, reach out to the IMAA and we can connect you for that. Thanks for listening today and thank you for my guests who joined us today. 